use headphones for best experience. I wonder if I can have just a little white on my finger to make it look like heavily cratered. And here's something called the weird terrain. To make it look weird. Just type in ASMR, ASMR and you will find it there. Today I would like to draw a map of a planet. And I haven't done this before, so it will be super fun to try. Actually, I think it will, be, it will end up in two maps, uh, one for each side of the planet. I will start with one side here, and then the next one I will do the opposite side. And uh, the planet I would like to draw is Mercury. The first planet, or the planet closest to our sun. Um, so we have the sun, and then Mercury. Also the the smallest planet in our solar system, smallest of the four terrestrial planets, and all the terrestrial planets are smaller than the gas giants that are further out in the solar system. And um, it's a bit bigger than our moon, um, but it's smaller than Mars. Um, it's actually smaller than two, I think two other moons in the solar system, uh, moons for orbiting around Jupiter and Saturn. So I will put the North Pole here and the South Pole here, and I have prepared this paper with just um, black ink. And... Uh, I thought I was going to try to add some white ink to start with. Because it's uh, to me it looks like a grey planet from the pictures I've seen of it. Um, but there are lighter parts and there are darker parts. Let's see how, how I can do this. Just use this type of tool. It's not a brush, even though it looks like a So 
So I'm going to start with the side of Mercury that has this giant impact basin, the biggest, one of the biggest impact basins in the solar system, the Caloris Planitia. It's easy to do like this. southern part of this side of the planet seems darker and darker means that the surface is older actually some um, some uh, very bright spots that has rays like this very bright rays extending for several several even thousands of kilometers I think in some cases so all over the planet it's crisscrossed Um, craters, because these are also craters, um, are the youngest craters on the surface.
Planitia consists of a very smooth floor, facing floor like this. There are a lot of planitias where um, the floor is more smooth and not so heavily cratered like the rest of the planet. For example, the Lugus planitia here, which is this. Sobku. Planitia and Catuilla Planum Tir Planitia Odin Planitia. And I think this contrast here is too big. And here should be very dark area around the Tolstoy crater. It's an old, very old part of the surface. So the reason for this uh, difference in the dark areas and lighter areas is just that um, more recent impacts from comets or asteroids um, are more bright because uh, the impact itself causes the material under it to totally crash and uh, also it's so it releases so much energy so the crushed like powder of of this uh, rock, rock material will like fly away in different directions and it will like create this race of um, lighter, freshly, um, it's lighter because it's fresh somehow, it uh, has just been crushed. Then after time um, particles from the from space, like uh, solar wind or just uh, other types of, of particles will, will make these uh, brighter areas dark. Uh, so you can really see which creatures are the youngest ones. Uh, it's those who are bright and many of them also, if they are very powerful impacts, then they will also have this very long rays, extended rays, in all directions. And then inside the crater, sometimes, like in the case with the with the, um, Caloris Planitia, um, because maybe before this huge impact here, it was just like the other old um, surface of Mercury, it was heavily cratered from the time when it was heavy bombardment of, of uh, craters all the time, like the first billions of years uh, since the creation of all the planets and the, and the sun and everything. Um, during the first, uh, I mean the, the creation of the, the forming of our solar system took place 4.6 billion years ago, and during the first uh, one billion years, 
there was there were these uh, I mean when all the planets and moons and everything formed then it was this heavy bombardment of comets and material for planets and asteroids then around uh, 3.8 billion years ago it stopped this the last uh, phase of this was called the late heavy bo bombardment and since then it's been calmer and um, but occasionally there will be impacts of course and there has been impacts but then you can see that those late impacts will result in uh, volcanic activity very often at least here on mercury so then the lava will come out from the inner part of the planet and create like it will like fill the crater so it gets a smooth plane sometimes in this in this plane a smooth plane you will still see even newer craters but just a couple of them not like like the old area so here for example i can see three prominent craters At least three that are a bit bigger. And um, since this uh, impact basin was so big, I mean, the, the impact was so powerful, the highest mountains on Mercury can be found here at the edge of the rim of this crater. And uh, this um, are called the Caloris Montes and they are like two kilometers I think tall or 1.2 miles tall um, and it's not that tall, tall actually because you can compare to the Olympus Mons on uh, Mars 22 kilometers high or 13.6 miles all the the highest mountains on earth Mount, Mount Everest if you count from from sea level 9 kilometers high or Mauna Kea Hawaii that counts 10 kilometers actually if you count from base to peak and that's interesting because why in, the, in when you compare compare it like this, why should you why should you consider the um, sea level? Because on Mercury there is no sea level, so you you count everything from base to to peak. So in that case, Mauna Kea is the tallest mountain on Earth, ten kilometers, compared to the two maybe more than two kilometers and the reason why there aren't so high mountains on mercury is because compared to earth there's a big difference there are no tectonic plates here on mercury and the tectonic plates where the moving all these moving plates who collide and eventually create the mountain ranges on earth that doesn't take place here, so the mountains can just be created by huge impacts like this. But there is actually another way. Mountains or cliffs can be created on Mercury, and has been created on Mercury. And that is because of its density and uh, gravity, because it's a very small planet just a 2.400 kilometers in radius or 1,500 miles and it's uh, only a third of the earth radius or 38% or something like that but it has an enormous core compared to earth uh, it 
it's uh, 85% of the radius of Mercury is the core and uh, on Earth it's only 55% of the Earth and uh, the core is like made of iron met and metal you know, solid in the center and then liquid or yeah, liquid outside and then the mantle and the crust is just very thin like this and it means that it's super has a super high density and gravity is very strong on this small planet and uh, that resulted in something strange that when the when all those um, late heavy bombardment stopped around um, 3.8 billion years ago then as the planet cooled down because when there were fewer impacts the volcanic activity kind of stopped also because it was the the impacts that triggered the vol uh, volcanism so then um, it started to cool down and actually the gravity of this caused by this giant core made the planet shrink a bit like the crust shrunk like this uh, several miles shrunk and when it did that it actually helped uh, the vol volcanic I mean it was a reason for the volcanic activity to stop because uh, if there were some cracks or uh, rifts somewhere and they were like squeezed together so it stopped being a way for the for the magma to to reach the surface it became really compact and then there, there were like rifts created or cliffs like this where the crust shrinked so on many places on this uh, planet you can find something called the rupes it's latin for cliff or something like that and those rupes there can be like several uh, miles long several hundreds of miles long and they can be uh, approximately 1.5 uh, kilometers high now i'm mixing kilometers and miles but let's see yeah um the longest rupes yeah are is uh, uh, 820 kilometers or 510 miles long and the highest rupees are something like 1.5 kilometers high and what will that be in miles? Um, I think one mile high or something like that now let's go on with some outlines And uh, I'll use this white ink with that. I was thinking about uh, drawing some craters, because basically that's what it is on Mercury. There are craters and craters and craters, and some of these um, rupes. So if I start here with the Fontaine crater, And the craters are named after famous authors, artists, and uh, musicians. And uh, Fontaine, for example, is named after an English ballet dancer, Margot Fontaine. And then I would like to add... Radit Radikladi is um, a very young crater, probably only one billion years old, <laughs> and that's young when it comes to Mercury. Yes, yeah, most of the surface was already finished so to say uh, after the light heavy bombardment 3.8 billion years ago but then so then the younger um, impacts can be like 
one billion years old. So Raditlade is a typical peak ring crater. It has no cent central peak. It has more like one ring and then another ring more further out. So it's like probably it has been an impact and then it had resulted in uh, volcanic activity and an effusive, yeah, effusive volcanism. Uh, that's when it's not uh, water or other volatiles um, included in the in the process. So they are a bit more calm, um, not explosive uh, uh, eruptions, but um, yeah, they're called effusive and it's more like slowly floating lava and then I guess this inner ring here is uh, a solidified lava from that type of volcanic eruption caused by the by the impact and the outer ring is more older an older surface and uh, darker area. Then there's a crater here with prominent rays, bright rays like this. And I'm not sure if it's the Eastman crater or if it's a uh, yeah, there is a, a crater here called Eastman Crater, but I'm not sure if that one is the bright one or if it's a smaller one to the to the west of Eastman. And then there's Eminescu Crater and Amaral Crater in the southern hemisphere. A bright crater here in the in the more dark environment of the southern hemisphere. Here are some rupus, the beagle rupus. Uh, it's one of the longest and highest rupus on the planet. And they are west, they are located here west of the crater called uh, Sveinstottir crater named after I guess an Icelandic artist or author or musician I'm not sure but it sounds Icelandic the surname Sveinstottir um, and here is the Kat Katuilla Planum this area is called a planum is a plateau or high plain. And um, it's named after uh, the, a word uh, in the language Quechua from South America. And it's the Quechua word for Mercury. And actually all the planitias, um, planes, planitias are low planes and planums, uh, they are named after the name Mer Mercury in different languages, as you will see. And here's a small bright crater called Envonvu. Here are the Paramur rupus, the rupus, the scarps, uh, escarpments, they are named after ships of famous explorers. And here are the Alvin Rupus. Here to the very south is a bright young crater called Hankan. of the craters with many bright rays, extended rays. I think 
this uh, Caligraphy Graphic Pen was actually the best choice for drawing these arrays. Then, yeah, here. This creature I will probably include on both maps. It's on the side here. You see it from the other hemisphere too. It is a Rembrandt crater, the second biggest crater on Mercury. And here is Granger crater, Shergill crater, Neruda. Dostoevsky crater, big crater here. Basho crater. And here, in this very dark area, dark because of, uh, yeah, it's a very old part of the surface. It's a Tolstoy creature, it's a quite a big creature. 400 kilometers in diameter. And the Basho crater also has, has some quite prominent rays leading up from it. And here to the east. Another very large crater, Beethoven. It's uh, the planet's third largest impact basin. Actually, you call it an impact basin when it's bigger than 240 kilometers in diameter or 180 miles. And the uh, Beethoven is not, as you could expect, a multi, multi-ringed crater. Uh, the larger impact basins are quite often multi-ringed. And that means that they have uh, uh, concentric rings. We will see, for example, Caloris Planitia, uh, the largest basin, has like if you study it closely, you can see there are some, some rings starting a bit away from the center, and then there are like several of them. That's a multi ring crater. crater. And um, west of Beethoven crater is uh, Jayofken Rupus. Jayofken. And here is a smaller crater, but a very bright one, Bartok. Here is the Logos Planitia to the east. Logos. That's actually the Gaulish equivalent of Mercury. And Mercury was the Roman god. He was the messenger god and uh, very swift because he had to always uh, travel between humans and the gods so yeah um, the Greeks uh, named this planet Hermes and I think it's still called Hermes in Greek because that was their equivalent of the Roman It's actually also the fastest planet, having the fastest speed in the orbit. And in 
ancient times, uh, when they observed this small, small dot, they could only see it uh, close to the sun. And from Earth you can still only see it uh, very close to the sun, because, um, yeah, uh, it's like an angle of, uh, yeah, it's like never further from the sun than uh, 28 degrees, since it's closer to the sun than the earth so it's another just like venus venus it's a morning it has been called the morning and evening star and this has been very uh, difficult in the past to observe it because yeah you have the sun so close and it's difficult to see the surface of mercury because of that uh, but logos was uh, the gaulish equivalent of mercury god and um, yeah, let's go through the planetias now, so I don't forget any. Bud planetia is here. It's a Hindu word for Mercury. Um, Merkair planetia, the Irish word for Mercury. The Stilbon planetia is here. Stilbon was an ancient Greek for name for Mercury. Now in modern Greek it's Hermes, I guess. Odin Planitia, the old Norse god. Um, it's not the equivalent of Mercury, the messenger, I mean. Um, but maybe there are there is no messenger god in Norse mythology in mythology, so that's why it's called Tyr planitia. Tyr is a Persian word for Mercury. And uh, so we say it's the Japanese word for Mercury. Uh, sorry, so we so say it's here. Here's Sobko, the ancient Egypt. Messenger deity was called Sobko. In uh, Lugos Planitia, there's a creature called Waters. It also has a bright ray system. And here's a um, bright area. It's the crater Vieira da Silva, but actually it's the crater inside, the smaller crater, and the newer crater inside of Vieira da Silva, called Mena. That is the red one, so you can see rays coming out from this crater as well. Sobko Planitia, there are two craters very close to each other, Pronti and Teca. Also from Teca, there are several rays. There's a feature that I don't know what it comes from, but it's like a curved ray. You can see it's a bright area. A line that is somehow curved. And in Caloris Planitia, I would like to draw three craters that are even newer, smaller inside this basin. And also here is an area called the Pantheon Fossi. And it's an area with 
actually. They should not be bright. I should not uh, draw them in white. But it's another type of feature on this planet. Um, quite unusual feature. Uh, this place was had a nickname. It was called a spider. It's like a radial lines from one point. Yeah. But they are like dark lines, so I will not I will not draw it uh, with the white. And here's Balzac creature, or mm, bright one, and Tiagarasha, also a bright one. Those two craters also have a feature called hollows in the center. It's like um, caused by some volcanic activity, magma, and then when the magma disappeared again, or um, like it was, the crater was drained after maybe a long time, then there were still some uh, some hollows that uh, collapsed and. You can see like a pattern in many craters looking like that. So it's like rest from from volcanic activity on the smooth like on the smooth floor but that feature is so small so I cannot see it from from this angle or from this uh, point of view and uh, here in Suisei uh, Planitia big crater called Shakespeare. Actually here I want to include it because I know it's a Swedish writer, Strindberg. So this crater called. But close to Shakespeare crater uh, is a very small crater called uh, Janacek. But it's very important, I think, this uh, crater, because I read that this is the place very close to Janacek crater, where the orbiter messenger crashed on the surface of Mercury in 2015. So there have been three spacecraft launched for Mercury. The third one is still on its way. It was launched in 2018 and it is planned to begin its orbit around Mercury in 2025. So, two years from now. That will be very interesting. But the first one was launched in uh, early 1970s. It was the Mariner 10. In 1974 and 1975, it uh, orbited three times around Mercury, and um, it provided images for about 45% of the surface. Unfortunately, because the Mercury day is so long compared to an Earth day, so unfortunately, it could only map yeah, the same part all the time. Um, for example, I know that half only half of Calois Planitia was covered. Um, and then in 20, uh, 2008, the next mission was launched, and that was Messenger. Uh, by the way, Mariner 10, after after uh, orbiting Mercury in 1974-1975, it just continued, and uh, probably it's now orbiting the Sun, still. But uh, yeah, the gravity and the heat and everything, the environment there and the Sun has made it not working anymore, so it, uh, you can't get any... I mean, the instruments and everything is damaged. Um, and the 
messenger was sent in 2008 and it was orbiting Mercury for four years, 2011 to 2015. And from that satellite, but there we now have hundreds of thousands of images, so that's when Mercury finally became mapped. And then it ended with a crash here, close to Janache Crater. So that's where Messenger is now. And here to the on the eastern rim of Caloris Planitia or the Caloris Mountains, or Caloris Montes. Mountains in planets are called Montes, or I guess mountain ranges are called mon Montes. Mountains, peaks, like Olympus Mons, are called Mons. So these are the tallest mountains the entire planet. I guess there are also here the other side. There are some lines and cracks here so I can see what the photos. of Shakespeare creature also there are some rupus zehind rupus and here in the Tyr planetia there are also two quite bright newer creatures with some rays and from the east man there are rays both from Fontaine and almost meeting the rays from Eastman here. So here it's actually a very bright area, this area here. Also from Amaral rays. So rays. surface of Mercury, of the entire planet I mean, is uh, about 75 million square kilometers, or 46 million square miles. And you can compare that to the entire land or surface area of the, the Americas, North and Central, or South. North and South America and Africa. Those sur surface areas together is also around 75 million square kilometers. And it's like that half of the land area on Earth. But the Earth is mu much bigger because the uh, land area on Earth is only 29% 20, of all the area. The rest is water. And uh, yeah, if you prefer, you can also think about the entire Eurasia continent and uh, Oceania land areas and Antarctica together. So those three also makes 
so approximately 75 million square kilometers. Now I think it's time to move on to the next map, the opposite side of the planet. Or just one more thing, I would like to draw the outline of the planet as well. Like... This, perhaps. to the next one. The other hemisphere, Caloris Antipode, you could call it. So this hemisphere has darker areas to the south and to the west and uh, there are these very light plains Borealis Sai crater, brightest of all craters. Sihto planets, planetia, Torms, planetia, Barangay, planetia, Papsukal, planetia, and Oparidi, Utaridi, planetia. I need to blend it a bit more.
wonder if I can have just a little white on my finger to make it look like heavily cratered, the old cratered area. So let's um, continue with craters here on the western part. There's Praxiteles, big, quite a big crater. It's a peak ring crater, so it has no central peak. So Rachmaninoff on the eastern part here is a peak ring or double ring crater. And the lighter area in the middle, probably the magma uh, that had floated up after the impact. And then a darker area surrounding it where the lava didn't reach. So I guess it was like floating up and not like not exploding so much. By the way, ex explosive uh, volcanic eruptions, I have read, um, is more common when there are, maybe I already said this, but when there are like water, uh, I think I mentioned that before. But uh, I guess there aren't so much water on Mercury, at least not now, because um, it has no atmosphere. So for a long time, scientists thought there were no water, I guess. But now actually they have discovered some ice, water ice filled creatures in the poles. Because in the poles, uh, the temperature never gets higher than uh, mm, something like minus 93 degrees or minus one. 36 Fahrenheit and that's why water can still be contained in those craters as ice form, solid form but uh, b besides of that uh, the, the whole surface becomes very hot during the days and I guess there's no much water because of that and no atmosphere um so I think, I'm not sure, but maybe that's why the, the volcanic activity is more effusive, or just lava uh, floating, um, and not this, maybe what you think of when you think of an erupting uh, volcano, or that explosion. And here's a bright Right, 
Sir, called Zeus, Zeus, I think Zeus, uh, named after the famous children book author, actually. And Picasso. Picasso is also one of those pit craters, or um, yeah, pit crater is another name for the type of crater I mentioned before, with the hollows, the pit in the center, that may have been a volcanic vent. And Ellington is a peak ring crater, so it's double. The rain or the rain close to Ellington. It also, it's also a peak ring crater, but this one is uncommonly dark compared to the brighter Ellington crater. Holst, Nabokov, another peak ring. David, or David, a creature with a bright ray system. But the one with the most bright ray system is Hokusai in the north here, in the Borealis Planitia. It's a very bright feature. So bright spot here. I don't know what crater it is. Rachman, you know, is uh, also very deep. It's the deepest um, place on the whole planet. It's five kilometers deep, or five kilometers below the global average. central basin here. Yeah, the basin that is partly filled now with the lava, I guess. And um, it's 290 kilometers in diameter and one of the most recent craters. So Rachmaninov, it's very similar in shape and size to the to the um, crater just a bit to the east here, but I showed it on the on the first map. The Radit Raditladi crater. And those are both young creatures. Hokusai is also a young creature since it's so bright. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
the second most prominent bright crater, Debussy, in the southern hemisphere. So we have rays all the way from Hokusai to this, meeting up with the rays from Debussy. It's a very big crater, but not multi-ringed, so all the big craters are not multi-ringed. Haydn, another big crater. Schubert. And the Discovery Rupus. Quite a long Rupus here, 500 kilometers long. 1.5 kilometers high. South west of Rachmaninoff crater, also there are some rupees, the Calypso rupees. You can see quite clearly in the photo of this area. And also here to the very east, there are some rupees called Enterprise rupees. And that's actually the longest on the planet, I think, 820 kilometers, or 510 miles. They are crossing this uh, very big crater, Rembrandt. That's actually the second biggest on the planet. I showed you part of it on the other map. Um, and um, it's a young crater, so it's quite bright. And um, I think it is 716 kilometers in diameter. And then, and it's both smooth plains in the center and more hummocky terrain in the surroundings. And the Enterprise uh, Rupus actually crosses the crater, and that's an evidence on that the Rupus were created after the crate the Rupus were created after the crater, because yeah, they cross the crater. Uh, 
so then the scientists realized that this uh, shrinking process that uh, resulted in the rupus must have taken place after the this uh, late heavy bombardment because uh, all the rupus are like on top of I guess most of the craters if not all the craters and uh, here's a crater called Abedin and here are some more rupus, Victoria rupus Dauphin rupus and uh, there's actually a crater here called Enhedwana and another crater called the Shelling Holbein Here in the very center of, yeah, at the equator, but also at longitude zero degrees. I think it's zero degrees, or if it's 180 degrees, not sure. But in the very middle of this map, it's a crater called Warhol. It's a bright, smaller crater. Should it be this bright, this one? The system of rupees here, where the this bright area, Borealis Planitia, starts. So uh, this one should be quite dark. This one, this one.
this crisscrossing. mentioning Warhol crater and it's because the area in the very center both at the equator but also at both uh, longitude zero and at the opposite side longitude 180 it's actually the hottest uh, areas on the planet and it's because of the weird or very unusual orbit that Mercury has. And I thought I was. Uh, I thought I, it could be nice to explain the orbit a bit. So if this is Mercury and this is the Sun, I can put it like this. And it's not the. Uh, According to scale, of course, the sun is not. The sun is much bigger than Mercury. But it's um, it's uh, Mercury is having a, a quite uh, special um, special way of rotating, uh, orbiting the sun. Uh, first of all, it's uh, tidally locked with the sun in a three to two spin orbit resonance and to be tidally locked it means that um, the gravity of in this case the sun in which this smaller planet is orbiting um, the gravity and the size of it uh, has such a big impact so the rotation of um, the smaller planet or moon in some cases um, have like um, it depends on the rotation of the smaller planet depends on um, the direction or uh, which which part of the surface it's facing I would say so for example the moon and our moon and earth if, if now this is earth and this is our moon then the moon is tidally locked to the earth in a way that it rotates around its own axis like this the moon from I have put 12 here, so you can see that when I rotate it like this, it's a full, complete rotation around its own axis. So the axis is actually here, in the middle, and it rotates, and it's not flat, It's it should be spherical. But I hope you get the point. Um, so, exactly the same time, the moon will rotate one time around its axis it takes exactly the same time for it to orbit the earth and that's why we always from earth we will always see the same hemisphere of the moon so this uh, the back side of the moon we will never see and uh, I guess it's not a coincidence, it has to do with the gravity and and it's, um, yeah, when, when a much smaller uh, moon or planet is orbiting a much bigger moon or star, uh, planet or star, then it often gets tidally locked in some way. And now back to Sun and Mercury, uh, their relation or resonance is 3 to 2 which means that it spins three times around its own axis for every two revolutions around the sun and 
and it uh, completes one rotation around its own axis every 59 Earth days. And uh, a solar year on Mercury, that means the time it takes for it to orbit around the Sun one time, is 88 Earth days. So 59 Earth days for spinning like this, one revolution, and 88 days to orbit, to complete orbit. But then, the solar day, the length of the solar day on Mercury is actually 176 Earth and how can, can that be if it rotates around its own axis every 59 days? How can the, how can the solar day on Mercury be, be three times longer? And um, it appears on Mercury, if you would be standing on Mercury, that it rotates only once every two Mercurian, Mercurian years. So if the year is uh, 88 Earth days, then the solar day, and that means the time it takes from one sunrise to the next sunrise to the next day, so one day and one night, that's a solar day. So it takes two solar, it takes two solar years for it to complete just one solar day. So one solar day is two years. It's like uh, the years are shorter than the days on Mercury. And this uh, strange uh, relation between year and, um, and uh, day is because of this three to two spin orbit resonance. It's tidally locked in that way, and to me this just sounded so strange when I when I wanted to like think about how can it be like that. So that's why I, I made uh, this uh, little model here. So I will try to show you um, if we start. Yep. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to describe what this is. This is the sun, and I have just divided the orbit one complete orbit into three uh, pieces, equal pieces. Okay, this is one third of an orbit, two thirds of an orbit, and a full orbit, three thirds. And this is Mercury, um, and uh, I have the numbers here just so you can see how, how many twelfths of a complete revolution around its own axis it has made. So when it goes from upright 12 to the next upright 12 then it has completed one solar or I mean one uh, one rotation on its own axis that's all we know. Uh, and it will take 59 Earth days. But this uh, uh, the fact that it's, it takes 59 Earth days has uh, has no meaning uh, when it comes to Mer Mercury and the Sun because Earth days, uh, uh, I mean, it has nothing to do with that rotation of the Earth. It's just a reference for us to to um, to get a feeling of how how long a day and a year takes on Mercury. So, uh, 59 days for a rotation will actually be 176 days. And I will show you how it works. So, we, if we start here, this, let's say this is the first of, the first day of the year on Mercury. Then it starts to rotate around its own axis quite slowly, and also around the Sun. And here you can see it's upside down, so it has completed um, a half rotation around its axis. But then you can see how it's facing the sun. It's actually only be 
it's on, on it two twelfths through its um, its full uh, rotation. So uh, after yeah, um, let's continue and see what happens here. Now you can see it's back with twelve upwards. So now it has completed its first rotation around its axis and it took 59 Earth days we know but we don't need to care more about that because as you can see how it's facing the sun it's just at 4 so only uh, 4 twelfths of the of the solar day has been completed yet and it continued to rotate and both around its axis and around the sun and then it has completed one and a half complete rotation around its axis while it has completed one full orbit around the sun because this was where we started and yeah I forgot to show you this now you see that it's 6 o'clock, so half through the solar day on Mercury. And now it has completed two complete spins and revolutions around its axis. And then it's 8 twelfth of the solar day on Mercury. completed uh, one, two and a half yeah six is up so two and a half um, revolutions and it's ten o'clock so ten twelfths of the solar day and here we are back after two complete orbits around the sun mercury has actually actually rotated three complete times around its own axis one two three so it took f the first year took 88 uh, earth days and the second year took 88 more Earth days, so a total of 176 Earth days for it to complete the solar day sunrise to the next sunrise. So the days on Mercury are very long and the nights too, and that's um, also why the temperatures temperatures are so extreme. Because, um, it has no atmosphere, as I mentioned before, I think. Um, which means it has nothing to retain the heat when it goes back into shadow from the sun. So immediate, quite immediately, when when it turns into night, those uh, eighty-eight night days will be much much colder because yeah, it will go from very hot day. It can be like four hundred and thirty degrees during the day or eight hundred Fahrenheit it's so close to the sun and no atmosphere and then during night it can fall to minus 180 degrees or minus 290 Fahrenheit so it's a very big um, so it's a lot of extremes mm. and Mercury also has a very eccentric uh, orbit around the sun uh, it's the largest uh, oval or I mean it has the largest I think you say eccentricity um, in the solar system and it means that uh, the, the orbit around the sun it doesn't have the sun in the center I mean all the, the orbits for all the planets are elliptical but 
I think uh, Mercury's orbit is is more extreme than others, and it's closer to the sun here, and very far uh, from the sun here. So this is called the perihelion when it's closest to the sun, and this is called the aphelion when it's uh, far farthest away from the sun. It's uh, 47 million kilometers from the sun here in perihelion, and or 29 million miles and uh, at aphelion it's for uh, 70 million kilometers from the sun and uh, that's 43 million miles and the orbit actually speeds it speeds here the velocity when it's closest to the sun because of gravity from the sun so the speed is much higher here and then it's not so high, even though it's a very, it has a very um, uh, quick rotation, quick movement compared to the other planets. And this leads to something that is quite unique, because uh, during some time here, around per perihelion, then actually the speed of the orbiting movement around the sun exceeds the speed of the rota rotation of its axis and as you have seen the, those movements are quite uh, close to each other so but still it moves a bit quicker around its own axis most of the time but when it comes here actually the speed of orbiting the sun becomes even uh, faster than its orbital or I mean its axis rotation and then something quite fun happens on the surface on some spots of uh, Mercury because then the Sun has, has uh, rise uh, in the morning uh, and then during midday on some points on the surface then you will actually see that the Sun slow down in its movement over the sky and it will stop and it will actually go back for a couple of days and this is when the speed of the orbiting around the sun is faster than the rotation speed on its axis and then after some days now I'm talking about Earth days just so you can get the time frame for this then it starts to move in the in this uh, direction again until sunset and yeah, this whole movement takes uh, half a solar day or one solar year so it's 88 earth days um, and then it's night time um, but that's uh, very interesting and that it also leads to that at some point where this happens uh, on Mercury's surface the point where it where it, where uh, the spot on Mercury is facing the Sun when it's uh, at uh, perihelion closer those spots become really hot so that's the hottest uh, places on on Mercury and, and it happens at the equator at uh, the zero longitude uh, or 180 longitude the next year I think so it's, uh, it's alternating so there are two spots on the planet that can get really really high temperature so it's here around the Warhol crater as I, as I showed you and also at the opposite side of the planet uh, just uh, southeast of Caloris Planitia and that's actually why it's named Caloris Planitia because Caloris means heat in Latin. So this is an area with most heat. So yeah, it has uh, very long days but quite short years, I would say. And also it has a bit eccentric uh, orbit plane 
um, in relation to the Sun. So if this is the Sun, then most of the planets will orbit in the same, in uh, approximately the same plane. Like, you know, if you draw a flat line here, you will find the planets on, on that line all the time, because they spin in that plane. But not exactly. Um, for example, Earth uh, will spin 1.6 degrees from from a zero plane, I, and I'm not sure exactly how you calculate what's the zero plane. But the outer planets are like between zero and one degrees differs from the from this plane. So uh, look, it looks like the further out, farther out you go from the sun, it's more likely that they, you will find them in very very close to the plane. But um, Mars, uh, Earth and Venus will be around 1 and 2 degrees differ from the plane. Earth is 1.6 degrees from the plane. Venus 2.2 degrees from the plane. But Mercury, that is closest to the Sun, actually have a tilt of 6.3 degrees from the plane. So it's a bit um, odd how it rotates compared to the other planets. And then also the tilt of the planet when it rotates um, is almost totally upright. Because yeah, the Earth, for example, has a tilt of I think maybe twenty degrees or something. I'm not sure. But quite a lot. Um, and yeah, there are planets that are. Um, tilted 90 degrees or so. But uh, Mercury has the smallest tilt, it's like not even one degree. It's very, very small. So it means it hasn't these types of seasons that you see on Earth, because it's a tilt that causes summer, winter or in the northern and southern hemisphere. So here it's more other other relations in the in the orbit that causes uh, different seasons yeah because you can say the night on mercury is uh, one season because it's half it's one year and next year you will have the, the other part of the of the it, then there you will have the day when the sun is up that's you can maybe call a season Now I want to mention this area, the weird. Oops. I try to look it, make it look even more weird. The weird terrain. It's located on the antipode of the Caloris Planitia. So exactly one hundred and eighty degrees from that huge impact uh, crater or basin. 180 degrees from that, there's there are some um, hilly grooved terrain. Nickname is weird terrain. It's also called um, Canoris antipodal terrain. And um, scientists believe that this was caused by this huge impact on the other side of the planet that uh, the impact created um, se seismic shock waves and uh, these waves uh, met up here converged on the opposite side and triggered vo volcanic activity and somehow caused this very hilly terrain. But I guess there should be some white rays there still.
Too much black ink now. I will just um, go through the planetias on this side to see what they are called. C2 planetia is named after the Babylonian word for the planet Mercury. And the uh, Turms Planitia, around the Debussy creature here. It's named after the, the Etruscan equivalent of the messenger god. And um, Aparangi Planitia, here, is the Maori word for Mercury. Sukal Planitia is named after the Akkadian messenger god. And uh, Utara, Utaridi is the Swahili word for Mercury. Borealis Planitia just means the northern. Finally, it became quite weird here, and that was actually what I wanted to accomplish. The last thing I will do is to draw the outlines of the planet on this side. This is Calori's antipode with the weird terrain. And here's the Calori's planitia side of the planet. I think uh, this one turned out a bit better to me. I really like the feature of this. so much for watching and uh, sleep well. I hope you enjoyed this video, found it relaxing. Take care. See you soon.